Well, my wife, Becky, loves to do puzzles. We were at Target yesterday, and this is what she bought. And so I borrowed it to bring it just as a prop for today. I'll deliver it back to her. Hopefully, she won't even notice that it's missing uh, before she gets started. She loves puzzles of all kinds, you know, word puzzles. She loves jigsaw puzzles. In fact, maybe this is why she married me, because I'm just a puzzle. She's trying to figure out. I have no idea. But anyway, so she likes to do these puzzles, and uh, me, not so much. I'm not much of a puzzle guy. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. I can do puzzles like this favorite one of mine, the farm puzzle. Now, I want you to know I'm not bragging right now that I can do this puzzle really well. But since I'm colorblind, I don't know geometry, and I don't have patience, this kind of puzzle really drives me crazy. I can't do one of those those kind of puzzles. Now, a few years ago, we were on vacation and my wife was uh, working on her puzzle. She invited me to be a part of this. And so I thought, you know, it'd kind of be a good thing for me to go do that. And so I went over and we sat down together to try to work one of these puzzles. And I picked up one piece and I was just looking at it and I just sat there for like 10 minutes. And I couldn't find anywhere that it would go. And that's when Becky taught me a valuable lesson that somehow I had just missed in my entire life. So somebody's going to get some help today. And that is this. If you want to know how to do a jigsaw puzzle, you have to start by looking at the cover of the box. That's the secret for this whole thing. You've got to look at the box cover. If not, you're never going to be able to figure out one of these things. You've got to get the big picture. Who knew? So there you go. Public service announcement uh, for you today here at church. Well, today we're going to start this brand new message series. And here's what we're going to be doing together. We're going to be starting this series of messages to give us the big picture of the Bible. We're going to be taking a few weeks together to try to get the box cover look at what's in the Word of God. Because some of us, when it comes to reading the Bible, let's get honest, friends. Some of us have uh, had a relationship with the Bible that's kind of like my relationship with jigsaw puzzles. Here's what I mean. Some of us occasionally reach in and find a verse or two, but we can't really make sense of it right? If we're just being honest. And this is uh, sometimes uh, everybody, uh, people's experience, and it can actually lead to humorous results. Uh, there was a time in my life when Becky and I were first dating, I just reached into the box, uh, I reached into the Bible, and I pulled out a scripture verse, and I shared this with her. It's kind of a 2 Corinthians 13, 12. I would just share with her, uh, greet one another with a holy kiss, right? I mean, it's in the Bible. So uh, there we go. <laughs> Uh, then there's this verse that explains my love handles from uh, Leviticus 3.16. All the fat belongs to the Lord. It's just, it's just an offering. Hey, I can't help it if I'm more spiritual than some of you. I don't know. Uh, this was a great parenting verse for when I was raising my son, Caleb. Uh, Honor your father and mother, then you will live <laughs> a long, full life, right? Um, as my goatee and my remaining hairs are starting to turn gray, uh, here's one of my new life verses. It's Proverbs 20, 29. The splendor of old men is their gray hair. That's right. Now, on the other extreme, on the other extreme, there's some verses that are not funny at all. When we reach in and pull them out of context and try to make sense of a Bible verse, some people have used this to harm others, even to oppress others. Uh, this one was used for hundreds of years. It's Ephesians 6, 5, taken out of context. It says, slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear. This has led to untold amounts of sorrow um, and trouble. How about this one uh, that was, has been used to bring about control in relationships? Ephesians 5, 22, wives, submit to yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Now, if you like that verse, you ought to read the verses that are surrounding it. Uh, I'm just going to say that. Um, then there's other verses that can just torture us if we take them out of context, reach in, pull out a, a piece of it, and just look at it isolated. Uh, this one really bothered me for a lot of years, and I memorized it in King James Version. Here it is. It's Jesus when he says, be ye therefore perfect. That's the way I heard it in my head. I'm like, I can't do that. I'm not perfect. I mean, he's got endorsing perfectionism here. What's the deal with this verse? So here's what we're going to be doing. Uh, we have a couple of prayers for this message series. The first is that instead of pulling out isolated scripture verses, that you and I would gain a big picture, box cover understanding of the story of the Bible. That's what we're hoping over these next few weeks. We've been praying for this. We're very excited about it. And uh, to help us in this series, we're going to be using a book by Joshua McNall. He's a seminary professor, and he's got a creative and inspiring ability to help us see the big picture of scripture so that we can understand how the story fits together. 
You might want to think of this like a binge watching a TV series. Uh, think of it in terms of different seasons, if you will. And I want to give you the, the titles of the seasons as he lists them in his book. The first is creation. Then we're going to cover the fall, Israel, Jesus, the church, and then new creation. If you want to be uh, somebody really advanced, come follow along with us. You can order the book yourself, okay? Go to our website. We've got a link there so you can get a copy of this book. It really is a good read. Uh, the guy's a very creative, uh, fun writer, and it'll help you get a big picture view. And I hope that you'll be a part of these series of messages so that we're not just kind of picking and choosing random verses and not understanding how they all fit together. Speaking of following along, I do encourage you to be a part of this Dive Deep so that we can each engage in the Bible. Pastor George mentioned it is the number one thing uh, that followers of Jesus can do to grow in their relationship with God. In fact, I came across a research study that was done of hundreds of churches and, and individual interviews with 80,000 Christians, and here's the conclusion of the researchers. They said reflection of Scripture is much more influential than any other personal spiritual practice. Wow, what's the one thing you and I need to do to grow in our relationship with God, the research tells us that it's to engage in God's word. Not just here at this hour, this is good, but also in our regular daily life to uh, be people that can understand the book and to be inspired by the Holy Spirit to read it. So uh, this is all important uh, because we want to join together in diving deep. We don't have to do this alone. So again, come to the workshop right after the service. We'll be offering it in other weeks, but uh, please just jump into this uh, with us. Now, this is all important because the Bible is the oldest, most verifiable book that we have about God. That's why this book is so important. In fact, it's not just one book. It's 66 books written by over 40 authors over a 1,500-year period. And these authors come from all different walks of life, different education levels, different places, different continents even. But here's the miraculous thing about this book, is that they all point to the same thing. They all tell about how we can know God and be in a relationship with God. This is an amazing book. And to understand the Bible, we've got to start, guess where? At the beginning. We've got to start at the very beginning of it. In fact, when I was new to the Bible, I was trying to make sense of it all, and Pastor George was my youth pastor at the time. I was in high school. Let's remember, Pastor George is a lot older than me, okay? <laughs> Everybody just, just note that somewhere. So uh, when Pastor George was my youth pastor, he told us that we couldn't make sense of the Bible unless we understood the start of it. He said, uh, this is a top button issue, and this actually made sense to me at the time as a fashionably challenged high school sophomore. George said, if you don't get the top button right, you're not going to get the rest of the buttons to line up on your shirt. And I was like, that's true. And he said, if you don't understand the beginning of the Bible, the rest of it's not going to line up. And so we're going to start today at the very beginning of this whole story. We're going to talk about our story, your story. It's the story of creation. And here's the question we're going to look at for the time that remains today. What does the Bible say about how God created the universe? That's what we're going to try to uh, figure out together as we go back to the very beginning of the Bible. Now, let me tell you, the account in Genesis is different than any other creation myth or account or historical record in all of human history. I'm an English major in college. Uh, that's what's wrong with me. I took too many English classes. And so uh, in that, I had to take ancient literature and study all of these different cultures. And I found that the Bible stands alone in the way it tells about the creation of the world. In fact, I think it is because it didn't originate in a human being's mind, it comes from God. That's why, unlike every other account, you're not gonna find in Genesis that we're the result of some cosmic war, or uh, the gods all got mad and started fighting a bunch of humans, or uh, like the Babylonian Enuma Elish, that human beings are created from the blood of a martyred hero. Um, instead, uh, we're gonna find how God created the heavens and the earth and how God made you and me. So let's dive in. Here's the first fill in the blank for us today. How did God create the universe? Well, number one, God created the universe complete and purposeful. God created the universe complete and purposeful. When you start reading the Bible, you'll see that 
Genesis 1 tells about how God created the heavens and the earth. And then Genesis 2 talks about, guess what? How God created the heavens and the earth. And you're going to already be confused. <laughs> That's because this is not written like a linear North American book. This is an ancient uh, text that we have. And it's two accounts of the same thing. So Genesis 1 is the big picture view of how God made the heavens and the earth. It's poetic. It's got some amazing prose to it. It tells about the seven-day creation, and God is given the title Elohim. It's a big, fancy title for God. So that's like the world news version of how God created the heavens and the earth. Think about 6.30 at night. If you watch the world news, that's Genesis 1. If you go to Genesis 2, you find the more close-up view, a different perspective, here we meet Adam and Eve. Uh, we see that God is referred to with a more personal name as Yahweh. It's the six o'clock local newscast, if you will. So uh, we're going to see in this story how both viewpoints share how God created the heavens and the earth and the universe. Although there is science in the Bible, this is not primarily a science book. This is a theology book. This tells us about who God is and about how we can have a relationship with God, how we're to relate to one another, and how we're to relate to all of creation. That's the point of Genesis. That's the point of this whole story. So in the creation account, we see that we are not here because of some cosmic war of the gods or some random collision of atoms, okay? We are here, in fact, because God intended for us to be here and as God makes you and me, he says something really cool that you need to hear. It's going to help our self-esteem today, I believe, because we got to go back to the beginning and look at Genesis 1.10. And God said, the Bible said, that it was, what's the next word? Good. That's right. Say this whole sentence with me. And God saw that it was good. Circle the word good. This is repeated five times in the opening account. It's as if God stands back and he looks at what he's created like a master sculptor or artist and goes, whoa, that's good. <laughs> and it ain't bragging if it's true, right? If you're God, you can say that. Now, what does he mean by goodness? Uh, because there's no evil at this time. So what is God saying? Well, I had to uh, go back and get a book from the director of Hebrew studies at Asbury Theological Seminary, Dr. Bill Arnold. Here's what he says in his book, Genesis, that the goodness in this verse tells us that creation was exactly what God had in mind. It is just what God ordered, no more and no less than perfection, and completely satisfying to God in every respect. So God's creation is good because God is good. God's creation is perfect because God is perfect. God's creation is complete. Guess what? Because God is complete. That's what we learn in the beginning of this story. We also learn something not only about God, but about us. Look with me at verse 26 of Genesis 1. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image. So here we are, ta-da, to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, and all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. And you might want to circle the word reign in here. Um, in the time of the ancients, when this was written, the other creation accounts say that um, we are created, human beings are created, to do like chores for the gods. Uh, and we're often uh, the victim of some predatory behavior by uh, these deities, you see. And so this account is so different. Um, and this goes beyond a to-do list for us. It tells us how we're created in the image of God. You're created in the image of God. Would you turn to your neighbor right now and say, you're created in the image of God. On your market said, go. You're created in the image of God. There you go. That's right. Now turn to your second choice neighbor and tell them the same thing. Go ahead. That's right. They too are created in the image of God. That's right. Yes. What does this mean? Well, it means that there's like a spiritual gene in our, in our DNA. Um, there's a hunger for God in our heart because you're made in the image of God. Every person's made in the image of God. Some just may not know it yet. Some others of us may have forgotten it. And see, friends, that's why we can sing, it's your breath in our lungs, and we pour out our praise because we're God-breathed, we're God-dreamed. You're made in the image of God. This means that you and I have the capacity for things like reason 
and choice and we have uh, an ability to make moral decisions and to take leadership and manage all that God has entrusted to us. So what does this mean that in the created in the image of God? It can also mean this, that when I say this statement, it is completely false. And here's, here's how it goes sometimes. It's my excuse. I will say sometimes, well, I'm just a sinner. Have you ever said something like that maybe to yourself? Uh, I'm just human. You know, that's why I mess up. Um, that's bad theology. Because <laughs> what does it mean to be human? It means to be made in the image of God, who's complete, lacking nothing. And he creates us out of the goodness of his heart to reflect his good image. Look with me at Genesis 2.15 for more on our assignment. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. Circle the words tend and watch over it. This is um, what God has entrusted to us. Pastor Christine Kane says we are created not only on purpose, but for a purpose. You're created on purpose by God for a purpose, for God. So what does this mean? Work. This means work is not a curse. Work is a calling. It's an opportunity for us to share the goodness of God. Last year, I was uh, on sabbatical at this, this time, and uh, it was an amazing four months. I'm so grateful for the gift that you all gave me and the gift that the Lilly Foundation blessed my wife Becky and I with. So we were able to travel to Europe for a couple of months thanks to this grant. And the weirdest thing happened when we were about halfway through that experience. We were in Paris, France, and I actually started to get homesick. Both of us did. Terribly homesick. And I was mad at myself for this. <laughs> I thought, what are you doing, man? You're in Paris. You can't be homesick. Here's what was going on. We, had, we were apart from our son, Caleb, uh, for the longest time that we'd ever been apart from Caleb. He just graduated from high school. He didn't miss us at all. But anyway, we were missing him. <laughs> <laughs> we were missing him. And so one afternoon, um, you know, I was told not to work. And so I'm just kind of like wondering what should we do? But I was feeling homesick. So uh, Becky and I went to Five Guys Burgers and Fries to uh, kind of help us out, to get some comfort food. That's right. I was in Paris and I went to Five Guys Burgers and Fries. That is a true story. And I'm glad I went there because while I was there, I was standing in line and I met this young man who also didn't know what anybody was saying. And uh, I, I learned that his name was Sam. He's from the United States and he was a young man who just graduated from college. And I struck up a conversation with Sam. Becky had gotten us a table. And uh, as I was talking with him, I said, okay, so you just graduated from college. That's cool. I have a son who's you know, just a few years younger than you. I said, what are you going to be doing next? I'm glad I met him because he said, well, someday I'm going to be the CEO of the Walt Disney World Corporation. I was like, whoa, Sam. I mean, dang, I thought you were gonna just say like, I'm gonna do laundry, you know, or something like that, you know. <laughs> but this guy has some goals in his life. So we started talking to each other. He said he was kind of homesick. He'd finished a college course and was kind of stuck there for a few days. He was homesick. I said, well, I've got a kid and he's not here. And so I was sad about that. So I invited Sam to join us for lunch. We sat down and for a few hours, we sat together and I learned his story. Sam is a follower of Jesus, and since he became a teenager, he, he felt called to leadership in Jesus' name, and so he unpacked this whole calling for us. He said, I want to make Jesus' name famous. I want everybody on this planet to know God's love. He said, so the Lord told me, maybe I could be a CEO of a corporation like the Walt Disney Corporation. And that's what I'm going to do. He'd done some internships with Disney in Orlando. And this kid's on his way. This kid has a calling on his life. He knew that he's created for a purpose. And I was impressed by him. And also, I was so thankful to God. Because here's a good God. I mean, knew our need and put us right in the path with Sam. And I was not only impressed with his zeal, I got in touch with my calling as well. See, I was told by Pastor George when I went on sabbatical, don't work. And I wasn't working. I want everybody to know that. But I was able to bless Sam. And I have a calling in my life to help make others powerful in the name of Jesus. And so for an hour, I just blessed that young man. Can I bless you for a minute? <laughs> you know what it means to bless? It just means to say good things about somebody. And I want you to know today, you are created by a good God on purpose. You're not an accident. You are wanted, 
You are loved. You are God dreamed. You're God designed. You are God's masterpiece. And he created you and recreated you in Christ Jesus so that you could do good works which he prepared in advance for you to do. This world needs you, friend. This world needs you. You're created on purpose, yes, and for a purpose. Hear these good words spoken over to you, children of God and persons of worth, daughters and sons of the most high God. That's who you are. And don't let anybody else tell you some other lie about who you are. You're created in the image of God. You're created in his image. Well, look with me as we continue in this understanding of Genesis and, and how this whole story starts. Look with me at the second fill in the blank. What does the Bible say about how God created the universe? The Bible tells us that God created the universe from and for community. From and for community. We've already taken a look at one of the verses we're going to look at right now again. But I want us to look at another aspect of the verse. It's uh, Genesis 1.26. It's on the screen. Let's read it out loud together. Here we go. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. All right. God created us uh, from and for community. And we see this in this verse. For God exists in community. That's why you see the words us and our. God is having a conversation with God. <laughs> Stay with me on this. We believe that God is one in three and three in one, meaning God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Olds family for many years uh, until my son left was, you know, Wes, Becky, and Caleb. One family, they're together. That's a, the best illustration I can offer you to what uh, theologians call this holy mystery. No preacher in history has ever been able to explain the Trinity. But we know that God exists in community and God creates from community you and me for community we uh, see this throughout scripture look with me at the next verse uh, that we're going to look at today Genesis 1 27 so God created human beings in his own image in the image of God he created them male and female he created them so God exists in community and then creates us for each other, for community. Both men and women are distinct, yet both bear the image of God. When God creates, God does so in community and puts us in community. And this is, again, one of those grand themes you're going to see throughout Scripture. I mean, think about it with me. When Jesus comes to planet Earth, where does he come? He comes to a family. When God made you and God made me, he made us part of a family. And he does so with Jesus. Jesus Begins his public ministry. What does he do? He goes out and he recruits disciples. He starts a men's group, if you will. And they get together and they start all these other groups. And they have all of these friendships and connections. And when the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost, what happens? The Holy Spirit comes on men and women who are waiting and praying together for the Holy Spirit to come. And then what happens? Peter gets up, preaches a sermon, and 3,000 people are added to their number that day. And we're off. The church is born. And friends, this is because God who exists in community, has called us and created us to exist in community. This happens because the first crisis appears early in Genesis, and it's not a moral crisis. In fact, look at me at the crisis in verse uh, Genesis 2, 18. Remember, God's been saying, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. And then the Lord God said, it is, what's the next two words? Not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. Now, I want to unpack this verse for a minute. It is not good for God's creation, human beings, to be alone. Now, in case you're wondering what that word helper means, it does not mean subordinate, okay? I was taking Old Testament in seminary when I first got married, and I came across this verse, and I asked my professor, I'm like, this will be a fun dinner conversation when I get home with Becky, um, you know, Hey, I was pulling verses out of the context, right? <laughs> oh, I'm the only guilty one. I, I see. Okay. Well, anyway, that word helper, I actually memorized it in Hebrew. Here it is. Ezer Konegdo means in Hebrew, perfect counterpart. 
Somebody who's like and across, somebody that walks side by side. This does not mean a subordinate. This means uh, a community together. Everybody understand? What does God, everybody understand? Okay, this is important. This is real important for some of us in the room. Okay, so God creates us for each other. God creates us for community. And it is not good for us to be alone. It is not good for any human being to be alone. This is the first crisis that appears in the Bible, is this one of aloneness. And even though these words are written so long ago, they are so relevant now, I, I don't have words to contain uh, what I want to say. I, I, I'm not going to be able to even do it very well. Can you just bear with me? Because, friends, what we need is written in these words and to be lived out here in this community because we shared with you before that Cigna Health Insurance came out with this incredible study about the epidemic of loneliness facing Americans. An epidemic of loneliness. HBO has got a new series that's come out and it's featuring what are they called deaths of despair. What are deaths of despair? Uh, drug overdose, alcohol overdose and abuse, um, and suicide. Speaking of suicide, the CDC reports that among our young people, the suicide rates are on the rise. Among Gen Xers, depression is skyrocketing. What's going on here? It's not good to be alone. It's not good. When God says something's not good, friends, it's not good. We're created for one another. And let me pause here and just say, if anybody here, you need help, then we are here to help you at Grace Church. I mean, we're not a perfect church, far from it. But one of the things we, we want to do is help one another and walk with one another and love one another and care for one another and pray for one another and greet one another and welcome one another and share the good news with one another and be there for one another. In case you're wondering, am I going to run out of one another's? No, there's 58 of them in the New Testament. 58 times the Bible says one another. Let us love one another, friends, because love is from God, and everyone that loves God knows God. That's what the Bible tells us. We will be known by the way we love one another. And if you need somebody to love you, you've come to the right place. And you've found the right Savior. I know this again because of the testimony I heard on Good Friday here at Choose Recovery. That's when I met Aiden. Aiden is a nine-year-old who was baptized on Good Friday. Here's his picture. Let me tell you his story. Aiden said his life before he knew Jesus was filled with confusion from changing from place to place. He was in and out of foster care since he was two years old. He says in those days in his life, he lied a lot and he was not a good listener. But he came to know Jesus when he started attending our children's ministry, Grace Place. He said, the kids there are fun, and Mr. CJ smiled all the time, and I liked the worship music, and it made me happy. And then he said these words, my life today is much different now that I know Jesus. I was adopted May 9th of last year, and now I have a permanent home, and I don't have to move from place to place. I have learned that Jesus heals and that he is good and that he helps me with my anger and I don't lie anymore. At least I try not to. <laughs> Jesus helps calm me down when I'm playing baseball. I'm still afraid sometimes at night, but when I think about Jesus and pray, it helps me not be afraid. That's why I want to be baptized today. Aiden's life, friends, was in pieces and then a family from Grace Church, Tanya and Buddy Roberts, adopted Aiden. And then they brought him into this family, the family of God here at Grace Church. And when I heard his testimony, my soul stood on tippy toes because that kid made our long story short, doesn't he? For all of us, our life has been in pieces and we need a family who can help us and walk with us and we need a Savior who can put us all back together again. We need to get the big picture once again today and friends, you are invited into knowing and believing and trusting that you are created on purpose and for a purpose.
And you're created by a loving God from community and for community. And you don't have to be alone anymore. Thanks be to God for this story that he's invited us into. And today it's our prayer that you would make this your story. That you would bring to the Lord your broken pieces of life. And ask him to put you together as only he can do. Let's stand for prayer. Lord, we thank you for your invitation to us. We thank you that you want to welcome us into your arms today. And so, Lord, receive anybody here who's far from you. Lord, anybody who's been running from you even. For somebody that needs to say yes to you for the first time. Or somebody, yes, to you for the first time in a long time. Lord, be with those of us whose life is in pieces now. Lord, help put us back together again by the power of your Holy Spirit and the gift of your grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody ring said, amen. Amen. Friends, the altar is open. We're going to sing a song declaring the goodness of our good, good Father. If you need somebody to pray with you, come down and lift a hand. Or you can make your seat a place of prayer. Let's worship together as our team leads us.